How the little piglets would grunt if they knew how the old boar suffers. Allegedly among the final words of the semi-legendary Viking warrior Ragnar Lothbrok before he was cast into the Anglo-Saxon King of Northumbria Ayla's snake pit. This was certainly how the History Channel show Vikings portrayed Ragnar's final moments, although I wouldn't hold much store by that. But it is certainly a colourful phrase, dripping with portentous threat for the fate of Ayla at the hands of the sons of Ragnar and the great heathen army that attacked England in 865 AD. Legend states that this retribution involved the Northumbrian monarch being blood-eagled, a particularly gruesome fabled punishment dished out by the Norsemen. Whether this happened or not, or whether Ragnar even existed, or uttered the words about a boar being avenged by his young piglet offspring, does not matter. It is the invocation of the boar that is significant and primal in the mythology of the Norse, the Germanic tribes, and further back in history, a lot further back in history. Boars are no mere pigs, they represent a powerful warrior aspect, and embody a protective power and kinship that has persisted for centuries and still remains. The powerful creatures appear in Paleolithic cave art and in Neolithic reliefs. They also feature in the 11,600-year-old structure at Gobekli Tepe. And the boar was worshipped, or at least the object of ritualistic practices in so-called Old Europe, before the coming of the Indo-European Yamnaya. A discovery at Vertiba Cave in the Borchiv region of western Ukraine in 2023 revealed an ancient Bronze Age boar cult among the Kukateni Trapilia culture that appeared to have been harking back to an older religion. Boar remains had previously but rarely been discovered at Trapilian sites linked with possible ancient funerary customs. The find was a series of five goddess statues that were sheltered by boar tusks. The goddess-led culture, which dominated a wide swathe of Eastern Europe encompassing modern Ukraine, Moldova and Romania, from the late Neolithic to the Chalcolithic or Copper Age, from 6000 to 2750 BC, appeared to be appealing to an older deity to help them, possibly to ward off the predations of the encroaching Yamnaya horsemen. Archaeologist Mikhailo Sakatsky of the Borchiv Regional Museum said of the discoveries, female figurines are not rare in Tripilian contexts, and hordes of figurines are known, but these were sheltered by the tusks of a wild boar. But the boar was particularly revered among their enemies, the then onrushing Indo-European peoples and their descendants. The foundation myth of the Greek and Roman city Ephesus in modern-day Turkey sees the city built atop the site where Prince Androclus of Athens slew a boar. Again, in Greek mythology, the fourth labour of Heracles was to bring the Erymanthian boar alive to Aristeus in Mycenae. The feat was seen as a worthy challenge for one of Greece's greatest heroes, as the immense shaggy-haired beast had foaming jaws and was wild and dangerous. Another story tells of the Caledonian boar hunt as one of the great heroic adventures in Greek legend. In that example, the beast had been sent by the goddess Artemis to wreak havoc on Caledon because King Oeneus had failed to honour her in his rights to the gods. And the boar is regularly seen as sacred to mother goddesses in Iron Age Europe, with examples among the Celts. The Celtic Gundestrup cauldron, which dates from 300 to 200 BC, features depictions of boar-crested helmets and lures. The element of the challenging hunting of boars was continued by the Romans, for whom they were seen as a praia invidia, or prey worthy of envy. But it was among the Germanic tribes that the boar took on even greater potent symbolic significance. This was certainly the case in pre-Viking Vendel era Sweden from around 540 to 790 AD. A series of helmets show boar-like decorations, with finds coming from the Valsgard boat graves, close to the culturally and spiritually significant site of Gamla Uppsala in Sweden. The graves could have belonged to members of the powerful Yingling dynasty, which appears in Beowulf and was, according to mythology, descended from the god Freya. The boat burials in Sweden are almost identical to the Sutton Hoo boat burial in England, and the similarities do not end there, but more on that later. The Germanic boar helmets were believed to offer protection from enemy combatants to the wearer, but also much more. They were believed by many to be conduits by which the wearer would skin change and become the aspect of the creature. This animist and shamanistic origin idea is similar to the Ulf Hethnar or berserkers who would become bears or wolves following ritual incantations and dancing. They were strongly associated with Freya, whose descendants it was once believed occupied the immense burial mounds of Gamla Uppsala. Freya means lord, and was the principal figure of the Vanir fertility gods, although he dwelt among the Ezir. He was said to live in Alfheimer, and had a golden boar named Gullimbursti, which pulled his chariot. 
These facets, the golden boar and chariot, are powerful Indo-European symbols associated with the sun and fertility of the land, the animals and people. The 13th century Icelandic chronicler Snorri Sturluson wrote of the god, Freyr is the noblest of the Azir. He governs rain and sunshine and so the produce of the earth, and it is good to pray to him for prosperity and peace. He also looks after the wealth of men. The deity, who was depicted with an enormous phallus, itself a sign of fertility and masculine prowess, was intrinsically linked with Gamla Uppsala, where he was worshipped at a great temple alongside Odin and Thor. The lurid and probably embellished account of the 11th century chronicler Adam of Bremen in his Gesta Hamaburgensis Ecclesiae Pontificum highlights the association and the importance of the site. It read, Now I shall say something of the superstition of the Swedes, that people have a very famous temple called Uppsala, not far from the town of Sigtuna. In that temple, which is wholly adorned with gold, the people worship the statues of three gods, of which the mightiest, Thor, sits in the middle of a triple throne. Wodan, Odin, and Friko, Freyr, sit on either side. The following are the meanings of the three. Thor, they reckon, rules the sky. He governs thunder and lightning, winds and storms, fine weather and fertility. The second is Wodan, that is, frenzy. He rules war and gives people strength against the enemy. The third is Friko, or Freyr, who grants peace and sensual delight to mortal men. They depict his image with a huge erect phallus, but they carve Woden in armour, as our people depict Mars, and Thor with his mace looks like Jupiter. They also worship gods who were once men, whom they reckon to be immortal because of their heroic acts. For each of their gods they have appointed priests to offer up the sacrifices of the people. If plague or famine threatens, there is a sacrifice to the image of Thor, if war to Odin, if a marriage is to be held, to Friko. Moreover, every nine years there is a communal festival of every province of Sweden held at Uppsala, and no one is granted an exemption from the ceremony. Everyone, including commoners and kings, sends their offerings to Uppsala, and, what is crueler than any punishment, those already converted to Christianity have to buy themselves off from the ceremonies. The sacrifice proceeds as follows, nine males of every living creature are offered up, and it is customary to placate the gods with their blood, their corpses are hung in the grove next to the temple. That grove is so sacred to the heathens that every single tree is considered to be divine, thanks to the death or rotting carcass of the sacrificed, they hang dogs and horses there alongside men, one Christian told me that he had seen 72 corpses of various kinds hanging there. In addition, the empty songs with which they conduct this sacrificial rite are so many and disgusting that it is best to pass over them in silence. Close to the temple there is a vast tree with its branches spreading far and wide, evergreen both in summer and winter. There is also a spring there, where pagan sacrifices are held. A man is flung into the spring alive. If he fails to resurface, the wish of the people will be fulfilled. The temple is surrounded by a golden chain hanging from the building's gables and plainly visible from far away to those approaching, since the shrine itself is found on a level plain surrounded by hills like an amphitheatre. These feasts and sacrifices last nine days. Each day they sacrifice a man with the other animals, so that in nine days a total of 72 creatures are sacrificed. The sacrifice takes place about the time of the spring equinox. End quote. The concept of the boar as a warrior entity appeared in both Old Norse and Old English or Anglo-Saxon contexts. It appeared as engravings on swords as well as shield designs and, most notably, on helmets. These include a number of Anglo-Saxon examples like the Benty Grange and Sutton Hoo helmets that were believed to transform the wearer into bestial porcine entities in the same way as the Ulfethna or berserkers were rendered as wolves or bears when they donned their pelts. These were very similar to those found in Sweden, indicating a shared culture between these closely related Germanic tribes. Other Northern European Indo-European cultures also held the boar in similar esteem. Tacitus claimed the Baltic Aesti had helmets with boar motifs and also wore boar masks. The Roman historian also revealed boar worship, or at least boar reverence, among the Celts, with the creatures being viewed as sacred animals. The continental Celtic fertility deity Moccus, linked by the Romans to Mercury, was a boar god, and the insular Celtic god Veteris was also associated with the animals. Added to this, the Welsh hero Kelhoek was said to have been sired by a boar god. The boar aspect was significant into medieval and early modern times too, and, as we shall see, is still relevant today. 
One example is the Boar's Head Carol, which I have seen performed by medieval reenactors, though sadly I was a child at the time and therefore don't have any footage of it. But the 15th century Carol is a perfect demonstration of the significance of the animal that has earlier pagan roots. As carols are, it is a Christmas, or rather Yuletide, tradition. The distinction between the two, now interchangeable festivities, is significant here. The eponymous head would be presented during a feast and would be hallooed by the accompanying song. According to folklorists, the song was likely introduced to England by the Anglo-Saxons, despite its becoming more widely known during the later medieval period. It is strongly associated with the 26th of December Feast of Stephen, being Saint Stephen, and it is here that our old friend Freya returns. The Yuletide celebrations enacted during the feast were previously associated with Freya, who was known as Ingwi to the Anglo-Saxons. And St Stephen was, in both Scandinavia and England, a substitute for Freya, a Germanic god given the acceptable varnish of a Christian martyr. In the Norse conception of the ritual, a sacrificed boar would be an invocation of Freya, a plea for favourable treatment in the new year to come. The lyrics to the chorus of the carol go, Caput apre defero, the boar's head I bear, Redens laudes domino, rendering praises to the Lord. The Christian veneer can make this appear as your standard carol, praising God as the Lord that is mentioned, but, as previously discussed, Ingwi, the Saxon name for Freya, meant Lord too. The practice of hunting boars for prestige continued into the Tudor period, with Henry VIII owning hundreds of boar spears. And the animals appeared on heraldic motifs of medieval and later periods and continue in ceremonial art to this day. An example of this is in the heraldry of Queen Camilla, which featured on the official invitation to hers and King Charles III's recent coronation. The press release that accompanied the publication of the invitation read, A lion, a unicorn and a boar, taken from the coats of arms of the monarch and Her Majesty's father, Major Bruce Shand, can be seen amongst the flowers. And finally, the name The Boar's Head is still appended to 39 pubs in the United Kingdom, according to a survey of common pub names by the Pubs Galore website. As I've stated before, these old habits die hard in Britain. Freyr, or the even older god he is derived from, and his associated boar is still lurking around every corner. That's it for this video. Don't forget to like, share, and most importantly subscribe. And you can also support the channel on Subscribestar via the link in the description. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.